So uh, I'll start off by thanking our sponsors. So we, many thanks to Wayfair for, as usual, hosting the meetup. Um, and to our two gold sponsors this year, uh, Akamai and Instart Logic. Thanks very much to them for uh, <coughs> making things like Project Nights and whatnot possible. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for uh, intros. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jonathan Klein, formerly of Wayfair, now of Etsy, and a, uh, a, on the international speaker tour. Because <laughs> not only did he give this talk that you're about to hear at Velocity in Santa Clara, uh, but he's also giving another talk at Velocity Barcelona. That's right. Oh, no. very exciting. So, yeah. So anyway, here's John. Please take it away. Cool. And the computer went to sleep right as that started, so that was a good time. <laughs> uh, cool. So we'll wait for that to warm up. This is a shorter talk, so I think there's some questions during the talk. And it's going to be about 30 minutes, I think. And then hopefully at the end we'll have time to discuss more things. If you want to hear about more standards, we can talk about that. If we questions about the talk specifically. So all the slides and links for this talk are at the short URL, if you want to check those out. I'm referencing a bunch of stuff during the talk, and you have to type those things down, and you can just find them right now. OK. So about me, I work at Etsy. I'm on the performance team there. I write the site performance reports, if you've heard of those. We have another one coming out, hopefully, in the next couple weeks. We talk about both our front-end and back-end performance and how we've trended over the last quarter. So the idea there is just to be transparent about it and show you guys how we're doing. And then, as Ben mentioned, I did start this group. So today, I want to talk a little bit about kind of new standards on the web, what you've learned about them, and which ones are valuable going forward. So maybe you've come to this meetup for a lot of years. Uh, you maybe have been to, bar been to one of the Velocities. Maybe you've seen some of the videos from them. And when you do this kind of thing, you might see a list something like this. So you may have heard of origin hints or client hints. Maybe Webby, Speedy, uh, or even prefetching. And when you see a list like this, it can be kind of hard to know exactly <coughs> what is good. What's going to make an impact on your site? So what should you implement? That's the real question here. <coughs> So let's start at the top and let's go down the list and kind of talk about each of these in turn and see which ones are valuable and which ones are probably better to, to leave alone. So the first up is origin hints. Has anyone actually heard of this, origin hints? Yeah. Two people? Okay, three people. So this is a, it's a draft spec. It's not implemented yet at this point. It's implemented as a response header. And the idea here is to tell the browser about server capabilities. So it might look something like this. You have an origin hint, a <coughs> uh, hint, and then a comma separated list of hints. Maybe some have a value, etc. And then they, there are a bunch of examples. So one example would be small request headers. This is a hint that the server can tell to the client. And this says that the, the client can send smaller headers, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so an example of that might be, um, sorry, one second. Trying to this up. So no accept or accept character set header, or they can send a short, shorter user agent string. There's also relative refers. This means you can send a relative URI in the refer header. And then you can make cookies. You can just turn off cookies. Uh, and then that's like, as an example, you might have somebody say, <clears throat> in a given subdomain for our static content, like images, CSS, JavaScript, we don't want to send cookies. So instead of uh, sort of having to enforce that with code, you can send that as a response header. And then the, the client will know never send cookies for that domain. <clears throat> and then sharing connections. So this means that you can reuse persistent connections that are keyed by IP address instead of by host name. So again, what does this mean? Well, if you have a set of subdomains for uh, wafer.com, for example, let's say you have image1.wafer.com, image2.wafer.com, if those domains point to the same IP address, then it tells the browser it can share a connection across those two domains, or arbitrary numbers of domains. And then finally, pipeline depth. <clears throat> this is going to indicate the maximum number of pipeline requests that can be sent per connection by the client. <laughs> so you think about a typical browser today around six connections per host name. So you can specify that number via this header. The goal of origin hints overall is to reduce header size and, in general, to optimize transfer. <clears throat> the important thing here is that there's no content changes required. It's just a service side optimization only. And there's sort of micro-optimizations. There's they're the kind of things that are going to help us get to sort of one second time to glass by reducing the overhead of each request as much as possible. But it's not going to have a huge impact on your site because these are far very, very small optimizations. If we were to make a graph of sort of the value of this optimization, browser support is not there. It's just a draft spec. The impact, as we just talked about, is a little bit low. <clears throat> Implementation, well, it's hard to know because the spec's been finalized, but it should be fairly easy. 
And then future potential, I think it's modest, but I'm getting a little aggressive. Uh, it's sort of languishing right now in the, in the spec community. The sponsor of this spec, Mark Nottingham, is working on Speedy, which we'll talk about later, in HTTP2. So he's kind of tied up with that, and Origin Hints has been hanging out for a little while. So this is not something that I would recommend doing right away. It's good to know about, it's good to keep an eye on, but it's not, not, not something you're going to be able to do today. Next up we have client hints. So client hints are the reverse of Origin Hints. They're another draft spec. This one's written by Ilya Dvorak, and they're implemented as a request header. So this is something the client sends to the server. And this tells the server about the browser capabilities. An example of this header might be chdpr 2.0. This says client hint device pixel ratio is 2.0. So if you have a retina display, the client can tell the server this is the device pixel ratio of this device. A full response, request response conversation might look like this. So you send the get request, send your user agent, and then you see that accept header, accept image webp, accept image JPEG, and then you see that client hint header there, the 2.0 for the device pixel ratio. And the response header, you've got the 200 OK, and then the important point here is this content length. So what this means is that you can actually send different content for the same URL. Because the response header has this very chdpr header in the response, caches will know to vary the cache key based on that chdpr header. So if you have one image with a retina version and a non-retina version, you can serve that same URL to two different clients based on this header. And the way this works is, is if the caches obey this very header and if the clients send this header. And then you have the image data as well. And the idea is to specify more than just device pixel ratio. It's also going to specify height and width. If you've heard of the picture element or picture fill for the, the sort of like shim for that today, uh, or source set, those are markup related optimizations for handling response and images. Client hints are going to simplify the markup. The idea is to have this handle on the server side. Your HTML doesn't have to change. You can use the traditional image tag and then serve the right content to the right browser. So, if we look at the chart for this optimization, browser support is currently nothing, but Chrome does have, <coughs> Chrome does have support behind a flag. So it's in Chrome right now, it's just turn, turned off. So it's, it's on the way. So it's going to happen hopefully very soon. In fact, it's fairly modest. I think it's more of a maintainability win versus a performance win. But in the future, it's going to make it easier for site owners to do the performant thing by default. So if you have a kind of a boilerplate server config or if you're on shared hosting, they can kind of implement this for you. And then you can just put your assets in the directory, and it'll automatically figure it out for you, which is pretty great. Implementation is going to be very, very easy. And I think in most cases, it'll be done automatically for you. Uh, and then if not, you know, it's, it's, the markup doesn't change at all, like we said. So it can just be like one centralized place in your code where you look at the header and then serve the right content based on the header. And I think the future potential is pretty strong. It's getting traction. Like I said, it's in Chrome, so I'm optimistic it's going to be good. But that said, it's not something you can do today because it doesn't exist in browsers. So at this point, you might be getting a little bit frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the point of this talk if you can't implement any of these things? But it's going to get better very, very soon, so let's keep on doing this. <laughs> OK, next step down is uh, Webby. Is anyone actually serving Webby images from their site right now? One person. All right, that's good. That's a start. <laughs> All right, so Webby. Webby is a new image format from Google. According to their studies, it's roughly 25 to 34% 30, smaller than JPEGs. This is a bit controversial, but that's the study they've done, and they've shown that in, in certain cases it can compress better than JPEG. Uh, it has a lossless option, so it can replace PNG. It has alpha transparency, again, it can replace PNG. And it also has animation. So for animated GIFs, you can use Webby. Yes. The whole purpose of this is to have one format to rule them all. Right? On the web today, we have JPEGs, PNGs, and GIFs pretty much everywhere. And with Webby, we could just have Webby and have nothing else, and it would handle all those use cases. And in theory, it would be much smaller than all of them. Browser support here is, is actually getting OK. It's supported in Chrome, Opera, and Android, so basically any Blink-based browsers, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the global share is about 40%. So that's significant. I think we can say that now we're actually getting somewhere. Let's see what Webby actually does in our real site and see if it has a, has a material impact. Here's a demo site. This is actually a PrestaShop template. I picked PrestaShop just because it had a sort of simple, uh, out-of-the-box implementation of an e-commerce site that looks somewhat realistic. Right? <clears throat> so I took this site, I ran through a web page test before I changed anything, just out of the box. And the key stats here are 576 bytes, start render time was 932 milliseconds, and then speed index was 1269 milliseconds. Before we go on, I want to talk about speed index really briefly, just to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to that. 
So speed index is a metric that was developed by Pat Meenan as part of a page test, and it's calculated as, <coughs> as defined here. So this looks complicated, but it's actually not, not too bad. So these are two different graphs that are both showing examples of speed index. The y-axis here is the percentage visually complete that the page is, and the x-axis is time. So this is a graph of how complete the page is over time. And if you see this page, it gets very close to 100% complete really quickly, and then you know, it takes a long time to finish. Speed index is calculated as the area above the curve here. So since it mostly completed very quickly, the speed index is pretty small. <clears throat> By comparison, this page went to 20% complete, and then took a long, long time to get up to 90%. So this speed index is much, much larger. So the way to think about this is the <coughs> average time elements on the page took to appear. It's kind of the general idea. It's a, it's a visual complete metric. Any questions on that? All right. <clears throat> so one of the reasons why I'm talking about speed index is because it's currently the kind of the best metric we have for measuring how fast pages appear to load from the end user's perspective. And if you've heard, if you ever like see the Chrome announcements for a new version of Chrome, and they say this version of Chrome is 20% faster, that's done with speed index. They take web page test, the Google team does, they have an internal web page test instance, they run millions of tests, they look at the data, and speed index is where they get this from. So this is, this is actually used today by browser vendors and, and sort of like core people who are making the internet work. All right, so let's take our example page and let's convert the JPEGs to WebP and then run another test and see what happens. So in this particular example, all I did was use the command line tool to convert all the JPEGs to WebP, change the paths and the source, and we got a 33% reduction in, in bytes. So that's actually towards the upper end of the range that I <coughs> said it provides. That's pretty solid. You can see speed index went up a little bit, 9%. So this could be just sampling error. Uh, it could also be because WebPs actually take about 1.4 times as long to decode versus JPEGs. Slightly longer, not a huge deal, but it might have something to do with why the speed index is a little bit higher. And then, or sorry, the start render time is a little higher. The speed index is, is roughly neutral. So this is actually somewhat significant, right? On a, on a slower connection uh, where you're, you're sort of bandwidth constrained, this might have a, had a much bigger impact on the speed index. I was running this on a cable connection. If you ran this on like a mobile connection with high latency and low bandwidth, then you might have a, a bigger impact here. And also, if you have users where, where they're on metered connections or they're in remote countries, then WebP, the byte savings here, are going to vastly overwhelm any speed benefits for the most part, just because the bytes actually cost your users money. So we look at that same chart for WebP. Browser support, uh, like we said, about 40%, so that's pretty decent. The impact, I think, can be quite large, again, if you're, if you're bandwidth constrained, uh, if you have a very captive audience where everyone's using Chrome or Android or Opera even, then that can be a huge benefit. An example here is the Chrome Web Store. Now, obviously, it's a super isolated use case, but the Chrome Web Store is only visible in Chrome, so they switched all the images to WebP, and Google had a ton of, of bandwidth savings there. Implementation, this really varies depending on how big your working set of images is. At Etsy, we have hundreds of millions of images in different sizes, so converting everything to WebP is sort of prohibitively expensive. But if you have in the order of, of thousands or tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of images, you can convert those to WebP pretty easily on the command line, and the storage costs are going to be fairly low for that. So I, I think that's, again, if your working set of images is small, it's something that's worth looking into. And future potential is okay. I think that's the kind of nice point here, is that the future of WebP is a little bit uncertain. Facebook tried a WebP. They tried rolling out WebP on their site, and users were a little bit upset. And the reasons for that are, 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 are sort of many. Um, there's, there's a few key challenges with WebP. The first thing that Facebook users were saying is that they were harder to share. So they would copy a WebP link, they would email it to a friend, their friend didn't have Chrome, they would try to open it in ID or Firefox, and no, no image. Right? So that's, that's a problem that, that Facebook had to get around. I mentioned that increased decoding time. That's not a huge deal, but on mobile devices, that is going to slow the page down. At that point, it's a trade-off between reduced bytes or increased decoding time. You know, which, which do you want to have? Uh, in, yeah. ba in battery, maybe? Yeah, it might be a little bit harder on the battery, yeah. I mean, the, the main reason for this is that there's sort of hardware support for decoding JPEGs, and there is not hardware support for decoding web images. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So this could happen down the line, but today there's that slight penalty <laughs> because of the decoding time. So yeah, this is probably going to turn up a little more CPU. Um, yeah, I think image decoding is probably not the not the biggest drain on battery life, but it might have a small impact for sure. Mm -hmm. And then there's some controversial studies around quality and size. Mozilla, the folks at Mozilla are skeptical of the Google data, and I actually read today 
they sort of doubled down on this new version of a decoder for JPEGs. Yeah, I just uh, saw that. Yeah. yeah, they came out today. So they're, they're sort of pushing a better better version of, of JPEG as opposed to WebP. And they're very, uh, there's like a 400 comment thread on Mozilla, on bugs.mozilla, talking about implementing WebP in Firefox. And they're just very hesitant to do so because <coughs> they're concerned that there's a huge cost to creating an image from another web. And if, if you remember the PNG battle to get that supported everywhere, it took a long time. Yeah. Um, do you know if those images like take up less space in like Dropbox? Yeah, they will. So the, the file size on disk is definitely smaller. The problem there is that if you're converting your site to WebP, you're probably going to have to keep around, keep the old images around as well. So you'll have two copies of image, all a JPEG and a WebP image. So you can serve the right image to the right browser. So in the short term, it's going to take up more space. Uh, but if you have an image that only you are using, you can convert them to WebP, and that would be a benefit for you for sure. And then the, the kind of last challenge is that there's no progressive decoding <coughs> yet. So progressive JPEGs are one of these best practices that people have been talking about uh, over the last couple of years. <coughs> if you think about a, a typical baseline JPEG, they render top to bottom, one line at a time. Progressive JPEGs render in progressive scans, so you get a lower resolution scan and then a slightly higher resolution scan over time, and the JPEG comes in and gets sharper. People think that, some people think that progressive JPEGs appear to be loading more, more quickly, and WebP doesn't have that. That can be right now. So you mentioned uh, fire, so they donated sixty thousand dollars to Mozilla to keep working on this new JPEG encoder. You donated the money? Uh, Facebook. Facebook, yeah. Facebook donated sixty grand to Mozilla to work yeah, on the yeah, new yeah. JPEG encoder. Yeah. Yeah. Encoder. So, the encoder. <coughs> encoder, right. Yeah, because right, because the whole point is you encode it differently than the existing JPEG decoders can decode it right. easily. There's no need to implement a decoder. <coughs> yeah, sorry. So that's, that's a great point, right? So we saw Facebook try to WebP. Now they're putting money into, into this new version of the JPEG encoder. And the point is, like, Facebook has a huge number of images, right? There's like blind blowing mm -hmm. amount of storage, right? So for them, it's, it's, a, it's a large amount of money if they can reduce the file size that they store on disk. Okay, so WebP is a little bit sketchy, whatever. There's like some challenges around it, but it is still a big bandwidth win. And I think one thing to point out here is that you can do this piecemeal. If your working set is small enough, you can try this today. You can serve it to the right clients, and you'll still get a benefit today. So I think this is something that, depending on use case, you can you can try out right now. All right, let's go on to the Speedy. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to say Speedy and HTTP/2 interchangeably. Speedy is a protocol that was developed at Google, and it is a precursor to HTTP 2.0. So HTTP/2 will be the official spec. And once that's finalized, Speedy will be deprecated. So Speedy right now is like a test bed for the HTTP2 spec. So I'm going to just kind of use them interchangeably for the rest of the talk. When you think Speedy, just think HTTP2. They're effectively the same thing right now. OK, so I mentioned it's, uh, it's the next version of HTTP. So most websites today are running HTTP 1.1. And this is the next major revision. I don't know if you saw, but a couple weeks ago, they published an updated version of HTTP specs. So they the working group that's working on HTTP 2 republished and split out the like, sort of ITF spec for HTTP into a bunch of different specs, clarified them, kind of brought them up to sort of the modern day, and that's going to lay the groundwork for this HTTP 2 standard, which should be finalized hopefully this year. HTTP 2 is, is very exciting. So there's a lot of nice features it has. The first one that people talk about the most is HTTP multi <laughs> So what this means, it sounds complicated. Most people don't really understand it, but what, it's actually quite, it's actually simple if you think about it from sort of like the networking layer point of view. So when you talk to a domain, you have to make a TCP connection. So that's like the packets that are actually getting transferred from the server to the client. Typically, with the web today on HTTP 1.1, you have <coughs> browsers opening six connections to each host name, as I mentioned earlier. And the point of that is to parallelize requests across these connections to that host name. And the reason for this is head of line blocking in HTTP. So today, if you send a request, an HTTP request for an image or script file or whatever, on one HTTP connection, that request has to go out to the server. The server has to handle that request and respond to that request before you can send the next request on that connection. This is why browsers open up six connections to a given domain. This is so you can send multiple requests in parallel. What HTTP 2 allows is multiplexing. And this means you can send multiple requests and multiple responses in parallel over the same TCP connection. So this means I can send like six gets spread across packet, spread across a single like flow of packets to the server. The server can respond with interspersed responses for the different assets, and then the browser and the server will negotiate and figure out which how to match them up, and then they'll compile all the assets on the client side. 
So this completely eliminates the head-of-line blocking problem in HTTP. And so the point here is that it doesn't add, it basically removes the overhead of a request. So one of the biggest performance optimizations of HTTP is reduced requests, right? With multiplexing, that becomes also not an issue. The cost of request goes down to almost zero. The other thing that reduces the cost of request is header compression. This is in each pack. They started that out with GZIP, they had some security problems, so they built this new compression uh, algorithm called HPAC. And when you think about HTTP, when you think about making a request to a domain, let's say your first request is the HTML page, second request is for a CSS file, third request is for another CSS file. Those second and third requests are almost identical from a header point of view. It's just the URI that's changed, right? So HPAC takes advantage of that and compresses the headers, so you're only sending, effectively sending deltas uh, from the headers. So this, again, really reduces the cost of the request. <coughs> so you're talking about multiplexing request responses on the same connection, you're talking about reducing header size, HTTP requests become free for the most part. Speedy also allows for prioritization. So the server can say, uh, we want these resources to come down first, the browser will take those first, rather than first, etc. And then finally it allows server push. Now server push, some people get a little bit scared about this. So we said the server can push resources to the client, that's kind of sketchy, right? Well, when you think about inlining, so inlining an image with a data URI, or inlining CSS, inlining JavaScript, that is server push. You're forcing the client to take an asset that it didn't necessarily want, you're just inlining to the HTML page. So server push is just a better version of that. It's like inlining, but with cacheability, because it's a separate resource. So there's really no risk to server push, it's just kind of a clear benefit over inlining content. Remember we talked about origin hints, and origin hints, one of their big goals was reducing header size. Well, with Speedy, we have header compression. So this is an example where the optimizations that come in Speedy or HTTP2 kind of invalidate the benefits of origin hints. And I think this is part of the reason why the origin's proposal is stagnating a little bit. <laughs> Once HTTP2 is widely supported, we're not going to need those, those sort of micro optimizations at, at a header level. And yeah. The client, uh, client hints also added headers as well, right? So yeah, client hints added headers. Kind of uh, canceling out the, the origin hint. Yeah, anyway. to some extent. I mean, so client hints, some people do complain about client hints because they're like, oh, bigger headers, right? And then Ilya's response is always, well, with Speedy, we have header compression. So bigger headers isn't that big of a deal. Yeah. And client hints, as you saw, the client hint header is very, very small. We're talking about a dozen bytes, maybe, maybe a little more. Yeah. So it's not, it's yeah. not changing. Things a whole lot, yeah. especially because as you multiply some of these requests, you know, a few extra bytes and headers is negligible for the most part. Well, what do you think about the adoption for HTTP two? Just the timeline. Yeah. So this is my next slide. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. So this is Speedy support. Again, Speedy's the precursor to HTTP two, but there's a lot of green on this sheet. On this sheet. Yeah. So it is the case today that the, the latest version of every major browser supports Speedy. That includes Safari with Safari eight. Awesome and iOS Safari 8. So this is in uh, Yosemite and then iOS 8, which are not out yet, but they're coming out this fall. So as soon as they come out, people start upgrading, we're going to have support in, in Safari as well. <clears throat> Even IE 11 has it, and you'll see this is a different color here. This is partial support. So this partial support means that IE 11 supports it on Windows 8, but not on Windows 7. But that's, that will change with IE 12. They're going to have its have support both on Windows 8 and Windows 7. And there are some folks at Microsoft about this being like, well, why? You know, like, why, basically? And <laughs> there's some, like, sort of low-level uh, networking stack-related optimization that they have to do. And there's, because of the requirements for Windows, set, for Windows 7 support, they're going to backport that work from Windows 8 to Windows 7 for IE 12. Do you have a question? What about this stuff? This stuff? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of, anyway. I, they, don't, they don't talk about this stuff at Microsoft. <laughs> Okay, so right, so, so today, you know, we're already at support of 60% globally, and that's before Safari 8 comes out, really. This number will probably jump to close to 75, 80% by the end of the year. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. So what, is, what does Speedy really mean for us in, in real life? So no more domain sharding. Because all these, all these requests can be paralyzed on the same connection, Domain sharding is actually bad, an anti-pattern. You want to have all your resources coming from one domain, so you can make the most of that single connection. No more spriting images, because the cost of requests is so low, why bother spriting? No more concatenating files. You don't have to merge your CSS and JS, it doesn't actually matter anymore. No more data URIs, you can just push that resource to the client. And again, since the cost of the request is so low, it's no problem to have another one. 
So this is great. These are all optimizations we've been doing for years. And with Speedy, they all go away. This is going to save a lot of developer time. It's going to save a lot of angst. And it's going to be a huge win for everybody. These, yeah. Do you have the um, compression benefit when you concatenate? Because then you can compress over larger sets, so the compression rate. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah, point. So, good, yeah. <clears throat> so the question is, yeah. So if you, if you combine out your CSS files, then and you gzip them, because there's a lot of similarities across those files, you get a better compression ratio, right? That that might be true. Um, I'd, I'd love to see some results, some like data on that. I think it's probably like yes, if you had hundreds of small files, you might have a problem. But if you have like five or six CSS files instead of two or three, I think that's probably going to be more or less a wash. But yeah, it's a, it's a good point. It's definitely a good point. Yeah. But I think in any case, like GZ is so so good that like even even in a, in a small CSS file, you get like a pretty good compression ratio, unless it's too small. Like that, okay. So this also means we don't have to worry about um, above the fold CSS, which I I've been seeing as a big issue. People have been pushing that out. Like, Inlining your CSS that needs to render above the fold. Yeah, stuff. inlining mm -hmm. CSS to render above the fold. That's, I mean, that's an interesting point. Uh, it, it's sort of with prioritization and with multiplexing, I think you can probably get away with not having to do right. that. Uh, but it's. So I, was looking, I was looking forward to having to implement some of that. Right, so just to, to give you guys a more background on that, so one of the things that Ilya, so this is his book, I'll just put this up here. There's a, there's a link to this with a short URL. He has the book for free online. But one of the things he talks about is. This idea of 14K, so getting the, the first renderable content of the page and the first 14 kilobytes of response. The idea here is that with one round trip, you can get enough content to actually show something on the screen. And so to do that, you have to inline CSS because you can't pay the round trip for another HTTP request. But I think with, with Speedy, you don't have to pay that cost. So you can, you, you can make the HTML request, and then that CSS file can come down very, very quickly thereafter. It doesn't need another connection, it doesn't need another DNS lookup, et cetera. So, for the most part, I think that's going to be fine. But yeah, I mean, if you really want to get everything in one round trip, you might still have to inline a little bit of content. Because you still have to like, parse the HTML, yeah. get the CSS file out of it, make the request on the same localhost connection. It might take more than a round trip. Well, the, the server could even just push the CSS. The server could push the CSS, but yeah, it depends on what point in the request cycle it pushes that request, right? If you can push it early enough, then then it could happen. Like if you can push it while you're building the response for the HTML page, then yeah, that might work well. Could be in the browser cap before you're done processing the server request. Okay. So yeah, if you forget the, the link, it's right here, the OS webperf. And let's so let's actually see speed in action. So let's go back to our test page. We'll run another web page test. And let's look at the connection. I think the most illustrative way to look at this is <coughs> so this is the connection to before we turned on CED. As I mentioned, we, we make six TCP connections to the domain. So this, all the users are coming from one domain that I set up. Here are the six connections. You can see six <coughs> DNS lookups, six TCP connections, six TLS negotiation segments, and then all the requests come over those connections. If you look at after CED, we just have one. One connection, one DNS, one TCP, one TLS. And then all the resources come down in parallel on this one connection. The other thing to, to point out here, so bandwidth usage. It's low here because we're just like dealing with this negotiation step. But once we pull down this initial C HTML file and start getting to the content of the page, bandwidth usage gets up pretty high and then stays pretty high for the duration of the page. If we go back at the slide, <coughs> we have this big dip in the middle here. This is probably parsing JavaScript and just sort of dealing with the page layout and all that kind of stuff. So by multiplexing, we make much better use of the bandwidth usage, of the bandwidth available. Did you say those are coming in parallel? <laughs> yeah, so it's you can see them interspersed there. It's <coughs> one connection, so these all come down in parallel in these multiplex streams. So you could get a few packets of a CSS file and a few packets of a JS file in one sort of congestion window, and then the browser will reassemble that. I just assumed it was serial, so... No, yeah, yeah it's all, I mean, they're all interspersed. Yeah. Will you be able to uh, still uh, make multiple connections? Multiple TCP connections to the same domain. Yeah, Speedy doesn't doesn't allow that. I mean, doesn't allow that. Uh, yeah, you could you could have a subdomain. If you want to force it, you can sure, make a subdomain, sure. and then we'll make a new connection. But Speedy just makes one connection across that domain. I was going to ask a similar question. I just haven't gotten too far into the Speedy protocol. How how do you intelligently group, or is there even not support to group assets? By group assets, you mean like prioritize when they're sent, or yeah, yeah and like break off, do another uh, do another connection. Do a couple more assets of Interesting. different types. So that's like part of the server prioritization stuff, but I think a lot of that's kind of negotiated between the client and the server and the implementation oh, of Speedy on the server. So 
I think there's not a whole lot of knobs you can twist as a like administrator to make right. that happen. It's more of like a browser level optimization. Right, right. No, if you were trying to bring it back from the developers, get, get it out of the development cycle. Yeah. Um, I'm not super familiar with, with how you would make that happen as a developer. I'm not entirely sure why that's necessary anymore with Phoebe. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, why you would want to like prioritize things? Well, I mean, prioritizing them, that would just be pretty strictly on the server. Yeah. I, I would think. Yeah. Like, like if something in your Apache config or an HDS is <coughs> Right. That's how the Apache CD mark does it now. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think the concern is more like, okay, so <clears throat> let's say you're, you're starting a page. You want to get some CSS, you want to get some images for site Chrome, and you want to like render something, right? You don't really want to have some JavaScript or some other images that aren't as important, like filling up the pipe, right? Because as because of TCP slow start, you only have a certain number of packets in each round trip as TCP slow start ramps up. So I think the concern, which I think is valid, is you know, what are those packets? How do you make sure those packets are the right packets to render something quickly? Because if you have stuff below the fold that's filling up the pipe with these packets that aren't necessarily necessary to render the page, and maybe the page is actually a little slower to start rendering. So uh, one detail on this that I'm curious about uh, is the connection view. It's much less useful from a diagnosing what's actually going on perspective than waterfall diagrams. You know, anyone who's working on those visualizations to make them like, a little bit more useful in understanding what's going on? I mean, you still you certainly still have a waterfall chart, right? Um, but yeah, the connection view itself goes to its value goes to almost zero, right? Because <laughs> Uh, before you had kind of like this look at exactly what's going on and the connection view and web page test anyway, just looks like a bar. So I don't know if Pat's working on this at all. You could certainly ask him. Um, but yeah, you still you still look at the waterfall and see how things render. One thing I have noticed, and, and we can be able to see this in the chart here. So this is after speed. It's a little bit small, but <clears throat> you see these giant green bars, and because everything's happening in parallel, it does it does tend to be the case that like while all the resources will finish more quickly, individual resources might take longer to finish, right? Because right. instead of having one resource block the line and it, it, it like all comes down in full and then gets shown, you have it kind of interspersed with the resources, so it kind of pushes out everything a little bit, but they all finish more, more quickly. That's what we were talking about a minute ago, right? So That's packets, what I was worried about, like static assets that you have to get down to to be able to do first render. Yeah. They might be coming from a different disk set or whatever, and that disk set may get hiccups, and that becomes part of the problem to get the the initial HTML and load. Right, right. So, so. so I think I think that the way you handle that is prioritization. And I think that's that's like an area of, it's going to be an area of much of like a lot of research, right? Yeah. So yeah, if you really care about getting a few specific resources down early, you're gonna have to have the server prioritize those. But yeah, I don't know if anybody is working specifically on, on visualization for speedy connections. Okay, so let's see what happens to the actual stats. So we bytes aren't gonna change, no content changes. Start render, very modest, 5% decrease. We don't expect this to change a whole lot. In fact, I won't be surprised if this might even be neutral or eventually even go up. Um, because, like we said, it's not really impacting the HTML download. It's impacting the resources that happen after that. But speed index, we got a 14% reduction. Now, that's pretty solid. This means that the page rendered like roughly 15% faster overall. Uh, so that's, like, that's, that's, that's pretty good for just turning on one, one thing, turning speed on. And somebody mentioned mod speedy, so speedy is available today. Mod speedy for Apache, nginx speedy for nginx. It's getting rolled into core for both of those, and it's 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 being very very widely supported. Another thing people complain about speedy sometimes is that it requires HTTPS, so you need to have TLS enabled for it. And people think this is a concern from a performance point of view. Well, Ilya has has made a website called istlsfastyet.com. <laughs> the short answer is yes, it's actually pretty fast. It's just unoptimized. So in the if you've, if you've optimized TLS to a large degree, <coughs> you're only going to pay one extra round trip for a TLS negotiation. So one extra round trip on your whole page load is not going to be a huge downside. And the security benefits are, are quite good. So if you're taking any sensitive data whatsoever, you want to be on TLS anyway, and then if you optimize your TLS, the cost is low. So let's look at our handy chart. <coughs> Browser support, about 60%, going up to hopefully 75 or 80% very soon. Impact can be very, very high. Reduce all optimizations, make the page faster, it's great. Implementation is very easy. There's modules that we talked about available today. And the feed potential, I think, is, is the best at everything we're talking about today. It's super widely supported already. There's a lot of basically no controversy around it. <coughs> it uh, and it's, it's going along very, very well. 
So I think it really is the per fault for what uh, just one question with it. You talked about the uh, header compression. Yeah. Uh, so I'd expect to see a difference in size. Was that just not enabled in that test, or did it uh, make a difference? That's a, that's a good question. So it may not have been enabled in my. So I installed Nginx in like a type of speedy 3.1 that I was using. That's interesting. I think it might be like a directive you have to turn on in speedy as opposed to HTTP. That's too. possible. Yeah. What, were you showing, or were you just showing like body size or not? So this, this number here is 387 kilobytes. That's the whole page. So that's everything. Um, yeah, so I you're right. I always bet that to be down by a couple of kilobytes. I don't know, maybe I just didn't put it on. I'll check that. Thanks. OK. So, so it's using Speedy today. Almost all the Google properties. Facebook is using it. Twitter is using it. And anyone here? Speedy? Two people? Three people? Four? All right, that's pretty good. <laughs> so yeah, I think the reality is that most major sites, most major web properties today that are serving things over HTTPS, are either using it or they're in the process of using it and trying to get trying to be able to use it. It's a pretty big benefit for a lot of people. So this is something that if you're not using it today and you have a site served over TLS, it's worth checking into immediately. Okay, last on the list is prefetching. And in this context, we're talking about specifically link prefetching, not pre-rendering. So not pre-rendering pre -rendering is like where you render a whole page. A link prefetching is just prefetching assets. So CSS, JavaScript, and images. And it looks like this. So it's a very simple link tag, link row prefetch, and then you just pass a CSS file or JS file or image into the href, and it will prefetch that asset. <coughs> the idea is you fetch the assets for a likely nice page, and then it's going to speed up navigation to that page. Now, why are we talking about prefetching and not pre rendering? Well, prefetching is actually a little more reliable in some ways <coughs> for a number of reasons. So, number one, pre rendering has analytics concerns. If you pre render a page, you have to make sure your analy analytics beacons aren't firing and seeing that as a real page view. You also have to worry about uh, basically rendering the wrong page, so you might not know which page someone's going to. An example here on Etsy search page. So, somebody searches for some products, there's a good chance they're going to click on a product, but we don't know which product they're going to click on to very high confidence. But if we fetch the assets for the product page, there's a good chance those will would, those would be used. If we fetch a single product page, that's probably not going to get hit as nearly as often, right? So I think this is like a much safer and much more likely to be valuable optimization. <laughs> uh, to test this, we can use web page test scripting capabilities. So you turn off data logging, navigate to some page, turn data logging on, and then navigate to some other page. And on this page, we are pre fetching some assets on this page for this page. And this will give us results that we care about. So, all right, let's run this through web page test. Uh, here's the test. And then this is before we turn on prefetching. Here's what we get. So this, this is, again, only the data for the second page. We've turned <coughs> the logging, got on one page, turned it on, second page. So we're only seeing data for a product page after first seeing the home page. So we're 85 kilobytes, pretty small page, 500 milliseconds overall speed index, but we're still getting two CSS files and six JS files on the second page view, which is, which is not amazing. So let's just go ahead and prefetch those, right? We can just put these link tags into the page and prefetch all those CSS and JS files. And then run the test again. So here's the test again. And then here's the results. So we got rid of all of our assets. We dropped the bytes down from 85 kilobytes to 50 kilobytes, a 40% reduction. And then we also had a 40% reduction in speed index. This might not seem very great because it's only 500 milliseconds to 290, but you know, 500 milliseconds is pretty detectable from, the, from a human's point of view. 290s are getting to the point where this is like the blink of an eye, literally, right? So that's almost instant. It's going to feel almost instant. And this has a very low cost. We saw the implementation back here. I mean, it was six lines of code, right? So that's a pretty big one. Uh, browser support is not amazing. <laughs> Currently, it's Firefox, Android 4 Plus, and IE 11 actually has it as well. <laughs> Although IE 11 does not support it in iframes. So <clears throat> this is something that I learned fairly recently. If you go to Browser Scope, Browser Scope has a bunch of tests for different <coughs> standards. It will say that IE 11 does not support prefetching. But it's because the test harness in Browser Scope has the stuff in subframes and iframes. And Internet Explorer decided not to implement it in iframes. So that's why the test shows that it's not working, but it does actually work in IE11, as long as it's not in iframe. This is also similar to Find Hints. It's in Chrome stable, but it's turned off with the config flag. So it's in, it's in Chrome. Hopefully, they will be releasing it soon. 
But I think this is the proposal that needs the most help right now in terms of people trying it out, showing its value, and then proving that to the browser vendor so they will turn it on. But it's already in Fire the fact that it's already in Firefox Android and IE is pretty good. So if we get Chrome to turn it on, support will jump maybe to 40, 50 percent, and then maybe Safari will fall after that. Uh, from talking to some folks at Google, they are not fully convinced that it's a win. So Etsy's running a test right now just to try to prove that it is. And if you guys can run tests as well, that would be awesome. And we can sort of publish data and show that it is, or it is not. It's not. Why, why does Google not think it's good? They're, just, they're just not sure. They don't have data. They don't have data around it, so they don't want to just turn it on right now. They're, they're sort of data. Thing. That's what they do. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. But if you don't turn it on your browser, how can you collect the data? Well, yeah. so. <laughs> but it's, it's beyond a flag now, so it's like ongoing testing. And Ilya's working with them to try to make that happen. When do those prefetch assets get loaded? Yeah, so they're at the end of the page load, so after you download event, they start pulling them down, they're prioritized last in the networking queue, they're not going to block, they're not going to be executed, they just go into the browser cache. So it's sorry to really say that. After the download? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so some people worry about misuse here as well, right? You can prefetch me way more than you need, end up shipping these unnecessary bytes. But again, hopefully we're, we're downloading some CSS and some JavaScript. In our example, we saw we went from 85k to 50k. So it was 35 kilobytes of CSS and JS that we fetched, prefetched. That's very, very little, right? That's like smaller than most images on multiple sites. So if, as long as you're responsible about it and not fetching an absurd amount of content, and that's kind of on you as a developer, it's not a big deal. And especially because these, these assets aren't executed. If they're just prefetched, they're just put in the browser cache and they just kind of sit there. So they're not hanging up the browser thread, they're not really causing the problems that a, a script type would. <coughs> so there, there aren't nearly as many downsides as people think, in my opinion. It's not going to blow users' bandwidth budget just to ship them another 30 or 40k of content. So prefetching, I think you can try it today as well. This is something that we, we have on Etsy right now. 50% of users are getting this right now. We're running an experiment today. Results should be coming in hopefully this week, and we'll actually like know if this is a win from a business point of view. And we're, we're pretty excited about it. Right now, it's, it's looking good. I'm optimistic about it. If it's not terribly confidential, could you post that? <laughs> so yeah, we're certainly going to like, it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're certainly going to blog about it when it's done. Good. So hopefully, it'll come out in a week or so. We've been running a bunch of experiments, and we're going to publish a big post about all of them. Yeah. So speaking of kits, so we, have you started looking at the sub resources? No. So we, we've been looking at that and how to. Leverage some resource in a closed loop way okay. to make some pretty significant improvements in the page load time. Interesting. What do you What do you mean by some resource? Like, so uh, I don't know if you know. Uh, you know Peter Lukaszka? I don't think so. Sorry. So, so we have this uh, concept called the site from service. Uh huh. And very very simple. So the content server. Starts a little bit of JavaScript that collects up the, from the navigation of the, the various objects that have been done. Yep. Sends it back up to the uh, server, or the plugin to mod page speed, mm -hmm. page a learning module, to figure out which are the most likely objects for that page. And generally, pages aren't just one site, there right. are dozens of sites. So you know, the root site that you're going to doesn't know actually what's needed. And then inserting into the page dynamically links of resources. Mm -hmm. So we're using that to uh, get pretty significant page <coughs> realism, page improvements, especially over high latency lanes for high bandwidth lanes. And, uh, and we're taking that further uh, as of cache notes. So that's, I think there's a lot of evolution work being done there, right? Because, so this is something that's like pretty specific to a lot of third-party vendor tools because it's not something that's easy to implement as a developer, but there's a lot of work going into this analysis of pages and then like building this learning engine on the server side and then intelligently injecting resources or pre resources for future page loads, right? Or even, like you said, kind of some resources on the existing page. Yeah, okay. So I think our client is upstream a lot of that and put the on. Yeah, I mean, it might end up on like mod page speed, right? You said you mentioned you guys have a plugin for mod page speed. Yeah, so, so it's so we've already submitted some of the updates to make some uh, links of resource more properly in the mm -hmm. And then we're working on the uh, mod page speed. Mm -hmm. What company are you with? Uh, Bison. Bison, okay. Yeah, I think so. I've also heard that Fast is doing something similar where it's like you basically s you can send a header from the server, the response header. 
that says like these are some resources you're going to need, and the CDN will fetch those resources from Origin and get them into the cache before the browser even requests them. So it's the same kind of idea. You know what's coming. You start pushing that towards the browser, towards the client as quickly as possible. So that's it's the it's sort of like one step further prefetching, right? And right. there's one of the things we're pushing for is <laughs> in, in various forms to extend the properties that are. Uh, Tagged along with the uh, links of resource. Mm -hmm. Right now it's just tagged. But you know, we could use connections more intelligently if we need the size. Yeah. There's a whole yeah. bunch of information that would be valuable to try to get some uh, news. I do think there's a lot of opportunity there, yeah, for sure. All right, so we're almost done. Let's just quickly wrap up and then we'll do some more questions. So throughout all this, you might be thinking, all right, so browser support, you know, not amazing. Uh, <laughs> really, speedy, speedy is the only thing we talked about that has wide browser support. But I want to stress that these are still good options. The reality is that for most of these things, you can serve different clients in different ways. Speedy is a great example. Webby is a great example. Because of that accept image Webby header, you can just check for that accept header and then serve Webby if they support it. And all the browsers that support Webby will send that, that request header to you. In addition, evergreen browsers, and remember IE is now evergreen. Uh, once these standards are finalized because of evergreen browsers, the browser vendors will very quickly upgrade everybody and will have some wide support in a relatively short time. Now, Safari is really a problem at this point because they you can't really upgrade unless you upgrade iOS or upgrade the next version of OS X. It's a little frustrating, but IE, Chrome, Firefox are all updating at a very, very rapid cycle. Relatively rapid for IE. <laughs> they usually backport to the previous OS on, on at least on the Mac, not yeah. on iOS, but on yeah. yeah, that's true. But they're still in like a you know yeah. once a year, twice a year kind of example, yeah. unfortunately. Okay, so convincing CDNs would be huge. Etsy, we have three CDNs, and only one of them currently offers Speedy as an option. Akamai has it as, as an option. Fastly and Edgecast do not currently. Mm -hmm. Since we terminate TLS and TCP at the edge nodes or our CDNs. To get any value out of Speedy, we need them to support support the optimization, or else we can't really do anything. That's where the optimization needs to happen. And in addition, there's implementation challenges. We talked about three things that are worth doing: Speedy, Webby, and prefetching. Well, prefetching is easy, link tags, no problem, but browser support's not there. Webby can be hard if you have a large working set of images like we do. And Speedy isn't too bad, but we need the CDN support. So what's what are some action steps we can actually do today to, to make this better, make the situation better? So number one, implement as much as you can. And then if you have problems, speak and blog about them. Go ask your CDM reps for support. And report bugs. We turned on speedy. We have F5 web balancers. We said, all right, let's check and see what happens if we bypass our CDMs, turn on speedy, and see if that's a win versus going the CDMs without speedy. <coughs> so we figured, all right, we'll try this internally first. We'll turn on for our admin only internal website. Turned it on, and we found a bug in the F5's implementation of speedy. Great. So we turned it off, told them with a the bug, and they fixed that. Uh, we turned it back on yesterday, found another problem, turned it off. So these are things where you know, F5 doesn't have a lot of customers using this today, and when you start putting this on real sites, you're going to find edge cases that aren't working as well. So it is really, really important to, to try these things out and report the bugs that you find. Because without that, you know, I was talking to somebody at Velocity about this, and we were like, hey, like that hotfix, when is it going out? They're like, oh, it's like out, oh, you should install it. So we installed it, and it turned on yesterday. And found something else, but she told me there were no bugs in their queue. So they think like everything's perfect. <laughs> and, and you know, this bug that we found yesterday, literally, we're not sure what the actual problem is. Maybe it's a problem on our side, maybe it's a problem on their side, but it's not great if you turn something on and it just breaks. <laughs> so we had some people internally complaining about it. And there's no way we can turn that on for our customers today if we're gonna like break Ajax calls, which is what happened to our internal tool yesterday. Mm -hmm. So the vendors really do need to get real data from real people trying these real standards on actual websites. So with that, uh, let's create the web, and thanks. <laughs>、so、could you describe more how you implement the CDN with the Speedy? So you said that the Speedy is all under HTTPS, and then how that be <laughs> Yeah, so we're, we're already serving our full site over HTTPS. <laughs> our CDNs already have our certificates on them. All of, our, all of our traffic, including our dynamic content, is going through our CDNs. They're just not caching dynamic content. They just terminate the TCP and TLS connection at the edge node, and then they route it through the network, and they give the traffic to us. <coughs> so for Akamai, for example, if we wanted to turn on speedy at Akamai, it's essentially a button click in the, in the web UI. But it's not supported by Edgecast and Fastly at the moment. 
And that's, that's something that CDNs are actually quite good at, right? Because CDNs have these distributed networks, they have very high speed links between their networks. You're much better off having someone in California talk to an edge node in California, then that, that connection goes across the backbone ISP CDN network all the way to our data center in New Jersey, and then we terminate it there, as opposed to taking the open internet path to New Jersey to get the content. So any chance you can get to get around New Jersey is is a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question about the different header um, uh, hints. Mm -hmm. So both server and client side, is there any, is this supposed to be like a micro format thing? Do you envision it the way that people want to use it? Being in micro format where there's no standardization whatsoever, and why should we, or should there be standardization for CDN? So yeah, so the, the goal, well, so it depends much how you're talking about. The Fastly one, that might be a sort of vendor specific one. So it's basically a response how to your service ending, the CDN deals with it. Mm -hmm. But client hints is certainly like an IETF draft. So that's going to be that's going to be standardized everywhere. Okay. Ideally, browsers will implement that the same way. And I know that Origin hints they want that to be the same thing. Uh, the stuff that Fastly is trying is a little more experimental, for sure. And it might be the kind of thing where a CDN says, like, hey, if you want this special feature, just like send us this header and we'll like do something special for you. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm curious on your thoughts on the uh, service worker spec, because I read that and it kind of blew my mind a little bit. I don't know much about it, I'll be honest. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, um, so for those who uh, haven't heard of it before, it basically lets you define like a scope on a page that could be something like a URL. Mm -hmm. So you say that if you access URL slash foo from this page, and then it lets you actually insert hooks to run like JavaScript before the page request is actually made. Mm -hmm. So you could, in theory, have a single page app that really is a new page load, but when it fetches that URL, it's actually just doing it all in JavaScript. So you don't need to do the weird like turtle link stuff or have single page frameworks if you look in with the service worker spec. So it would really change how we do web Web workers. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah. You fix app cache, which it got. This is like a two minute video that Google uh, did for IO that, like a five minute video where the guy, you know, it's like, oh, there's all these bugs in app cache and Mm -hmm. Service workers. Yeah, app cache, app cache is pretty terrible. Right? Yeah, well, that's what you it's kind of is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a first step towards someone, something. Right. Like, great. Well, but this replaces. This would be the way to deal with that. This this sort of replaces app cache for. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like the Meteor model, right? Like the Meteor framework, where yeah. it's like streaming real time updates uh, without four page refreshes. I think I think that has a lot of promise. You know, Meteor has some. It's still being done with whatever its images right now, but I like <coughs> that model quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is something that's like running jobs from the server and the client seems smart. WebSockets enable a lot of really interesting things to happen there. But pushing the data to the browser in real time is fantastic. And then you know it's going to change a lot of the way that we look at waterfalls and stuff like that. All of the analysis tools have to change, but there it does have a lot of promise. And even more with Speedy, I think that's even more valuable because you can push these resources off the same connection and use another one connection to the server, keep it open, and just like send stuff bidirectionally all the time. So I think I think these new stuff, these new standards, will enable that even more than just today. So actually, that prompts a follow-up related to connections. Like, yeah. so many um, servers like try to optimize the number of concurrent connections because they have to have so many of them, right? Right, now. right. Uh, how's that going to affect that? So that's, I think that's a huge benefit of the speedy as well, right? So instead of having six connections per browser, per host name, you have one. Mm -hmm. So it dramatically reduces the load on the server from a connection point of view as well. So speedy is a big win across the, across the board. Any yeah, other questions? Yeah. Just how just did, did it have to be like a deal with the devil that it had to be TLS or just something? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of debate about the TLS <laughs> the TLS requirement, and as far as I know, it's not a it's not necessarily going to be a requirement HTTP two. They're still talking about it. I think there's some vocal arguments <coughs> on both sides. It is for speedy, but HTTP two is not clear if it will be. I I think it's 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 much more about the security aspect versus performance. I think with hard bleed and stuff like that, you know, it was like well. I guess pre hard believe it was like, hey, HTTPS is the greatest. And then after hard believe it was like, well, maybe not so much. <laughs> but still, I mean, non HTTPS connections are just really sketchy, right? I mean, if you remember the FireSheep thing. <laughs> so I don't know if FireSheep was this Firefox extension where if you're on the same Wi Fi as anyone using Facebook pre HTTPS on Facebook, you could just script their credentials and log in as them. Click the button and fire and fire. Yeah, your seller during that period was a good time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get an Amtrak and just like have everyone's Facebook account. So there's some real, real problems with HTTP. And I think having TLS be a requirement is probably the way the web's going to go. Yeah. 
uh, with the village requirements and speedy, you said optimize sports speeding? Yep. Speeding? Yep. Um, did you have to, like, I know a lot of people like to use their own subdomain that just goes to a CDN. Yeah. Obviously, to do that on a CDN, you have to hand them a private cert. Yep. That's right. Um, is that what you had to do with Akamai? Yeah, you upload your certs to Akamai. <clears throat> yeah, and you can certainly like have a static content domain and then serve that over speedy and have a different cert for that and have a completely separate domain for your CDN and not send your domain to your CDN. That's possible. And you'll still get some benefits there if you're, all your static content is coming off of one subdomain or one just other domain. Um, but we just decided to do that because of the edge of speed and TLS determination. We trust Akamai more or less. <laughs> uh, do you know of any like camera apps that will let you take a photo and just convert it to WebP by default? I don't off the top of my head, yeah. Um, that's interesting. You could probably write that into, certainly into Android. It's not supported on iOS, so. But they have a library you can, you can. Yeah, there's a, there's like a C WebP, it's like command line library that you can use to convert things to WebP on the, on the fly. So you could pretty easily like, if you have to upload an image to a server, you could convert on the fly to be on the server. Any other questions? All right, well, I'll stick around and buy more pizza, and feel free to come up and ask me more stuff if you want to. Thanks for coming. <laughs>